Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Culture of AI, a topic that I'm sure you are reading quite a bit about or hearing quite a bit about. And we hope that uh, today's conversation leaves you with some insights that maybe you haven't thought about, and most importantly, insights that may help you think about how you begin to integrate, or if you already have started integrating AI into the culture of your organization, how you may be able to optimize that. I'm Allison DeFlorio, co-founder and managing partner of Exude Human Capital, and I am so honored to have with us today, John Hack, Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Interflection, an AI-powered tool to help leaders become the best versions of themselves. Welcome, John. Thank you, Allison. Glad to be here. I'm going to have John uh, tell you a little bit more about his background in this space and a little bit more about interflection and and the work that he has done in AI. But I have to tell you that uh, I like to refer to John as the AI whisperer. And if any of you haven't listened to the podcast uh, that John and I did a couple of months ago, uh, you'll you'll see why we, we call him that. And perhaps at the end of today's session, you'll be calling him that as well. A couple of housekeeping tips uh, for everyone who is joining today. This session is being recorded. We will be sending out a recording to everyone who attends. We uh, ask you to please share it with those that maybe you know wanted to attend but weren't able to join us today. Your, your uh, microphones will be muted. However, your questions are very important to us. So please feel free to add them into the QA and John and I will be monitoring throughout and do our best to address your questions throughout the session or certainly at the end, uh, we'll, we'll try to address them. If for any reason we can't, um, I'm sure John, and I hope you're okay if I say this, would be happy to address any of your specific questions uh, post the webinar and certainly to That's the questions right. that I can address as well. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, so with that, oh, also, if anyone has any technical issues, uh, please put that in the Q&A and our uh, marketing team who's listening, thank you, Whitney, will be able to help you address those. Uh, so before I introduce, um, have John introduce himself, I just wanna talk about what we're gonna talk about today and certainly you saw from the invitation that we're gonna talk about how are today's organizations introducing AI into the workplace. Some of you listening, again, may be at different stages, but we'll share some examples of how we're seeing it done, whether it's with our clients or whether it's with uh, other organizations that, we, that have shared those stories. And what impacts AI can have on organizational culture? And I think that's really important. We're hearing many of these presentations focus on the implementation and the things to consider, uh, but but what is the impact to the actual culture of an organization, and what must leaders be thinking about at before you implement, so that you can ensure that you're driving or supporting the culture that you're trying to drive and lead in your organization. And then what to expect in the next 18 months, or as I heard one comedian say the other day with AI, what to expect on Thursday, um, because things are changing so quickly. Um, so that's a little bit about what we're gonna cover today. Um, I would like to introduce uh, John Hack, or allow John to, to uh, tell, tell us a little bit more about your background in this space and how you, you came to discover interflection and and what we can expect today. Thanks, Allison. So I'm a longtime practitioner. Uh, started my career uh, back in the 80s after MIT, working in the Natural Language Processing Research and Development Group at Wang Laboratories, which is a company most of you probably don't have any memory of. And over the course of the next several decades, I spent most of my effort on performance management and analytic systems, including uh, running SAP's performance management innovation labs for a number of years. Uh, during that time, we looked more and more at the drivers of 
performance as human performance. And uh, in the late 20 teens, as it became clear that natural language processing was maturing to a point where it could be useful in the workplace, a uh, gentleman that I'd uh, worked with uh, on and off for many years and I decided to that there was an opportunity to help people develop their conversational skills in the workplace by having them interact naturally in their own voice in a role play with an AI and have that AI analyze what they say, how they say it, and give them feedback to make their interactions in the workplace more effective and uh, make the workplace more harmonious and productive. That was the founding of Interflection, and that's what I've been working on for the last five years. Happy to follow up with anyone uh, who's interested in that sort of technology to help scale interpersonal skills development uh, with, within the organization. Uh, long story short, I've spent a number of decades in this space uh, implementing systems that change how companies work to make them more uh, effective and, and performant. So uh, a couple of items, I, I wanna reinforce what Allison said about asking questions in the chat. Uh, please, we wanna address your concerns as they come up. We wanna engage your thoughts. So, so please be part of the conversation. The other thing I wanna mention is that all of the images you see with, uh, aside from one advertisement, uh, from a long ago product are cre were created by AI. So everything that you're seeing here was you know, generated by AI. So a little bit of uh, showing by example. You know, and I have to say that first opening uh, slide reminded me, which some people on the call may not remember either, of the Jetsons. And, you know, growing up, seeing this as a young person and saying, oh, wow, this is really happening. We do have hover vehicles and we do have self-driving vehicles and things like that. So thank you for adding those, John, into, into the context for today. So I think it's important that we just share our insights on what do we mean by culture in the context of this conversation, you know, traditional definition of culture, maybe a shared set of values, norms, belief systems that influence how we do the work. You know, we hear organizations say, well, we're innovative and we are um, collaborative and we are respectful. Um, and that informs the culture of an organization. John, how do you define culture in the context of our conversation today? My background in analytics, uh, Allison, gives me a different perspective. I'm interested in what we can measure. What do people actually do? We can't measure what's going on inside their heads, but we can look at those behaviors, like how people communicate and collaborate. What workflows do they engage in? With whom do they work and how and to what end? And ultimately, I think an important component of it is how are decisions made? And in, in many ways, that's maybe not what drives the culture, but these are the things that, uh, that that's how culture manifests. And that's the part of it that we can see. And that's interesting too, when you talk about how decisions are made, that is an important, some, some organizations are very centralized in how decisions are made, other organizations are decentralized, and AI can really support or augment that process, and, and I'm sure you'll share some insights around that today. Yep. So, John, why don't you set the table, give us a little bit of context uh, for where we are uh, with AI before we get into, you know, so what, what does that all mean? Absolutely. And I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch of technology conversation. Uh, Kodak was one of the great technology companies of the 20th century, uh, under underappreciated, I think, to this day. It used to be that photography required working in the dark in a laboratory with dangerous chemicals for hours. It was not something that everybody could do. Very few people did it. Kodak invented the very idea of getting something as a service. You press the button, we do the rest. They'll take care of processing the film. And in a sense, generative AI today is the same concept. You can ask for an image or marketing copy or computer code, and it gives you one. 
Think of it as creativity as a service. The impact of that can be very significant. Imagine going to your head of operations and telling them that a free tool would generate 12% increase in productivity with a 40% increase in quality. They would be flabbergasted. Those numbers are real. That, that was a real study. And I can get into more detail if people have questions. One of the interesting findings of that was that the underperformers benefited most from AI assistance. And I think that's what attributable, although the study didn't go into it, to what I call the blank page syndrome. How do you go from nothing to having a press release? How do you go from nothing to having a really good picture to use in your marketing brochure? And AI jumpstarts that creative process and gives you something to work with, to criticize, to improve. And the top performers generally can do that on their own. Average and underperformers benefit greatly from having that initial boost. And it just just from my own personal experience, because those are places where I have dabbled in in use of AI, getting that first draft of something. For anyone listening who hasn't played around with that, please do so. That's our we encourage that tip of the day. Uh, try it for your first draft. Obviously, it's just a first draft, but it can save hours of time, honestly, to to get that starting point. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting finding that it helps other performers that, you know, just get a start. It, it levels the playing field for getting a starting point in one way of thinking about it. Yeah. And I, I, I know we want to get through this early part a little bit quickly, but I want to highlight a couple of conversations I've had recently because I think it goes to your point here, Allison. I, I like to talk to people like at cocktail parties about, you know, what's going on in in their uh, world with with A.I., and you know, a person who does uh, marketing research for consumer brands was telling me that she could take all of those consumer surveys, dump it into an AI, and create a first draft of the analysis of all of the you know this is textual conversational, you know, transcripts, and save herself four to six hours of the initial assembly of that report. She's familiar with the research; she can modify it to clean it up. But that initial creation of the report is a huge time saver for her. And she's doing this, you know, without like telling her boss, you know, um, and, and it, it's super helpful. Another gentleman I spoke to couldn't get the funding to hire a programmer. So he started using AI to write the computer programs that he needed to do the work that he was trying to accomplish. These things are happening out there. So it's when we talk about underperformers, often it's novice performers, mm -hmm. people who maybe are trying to learn a new skill. And this is a way to jumpstart that. I read an article recently also that it can help with crafting um, Excel formulas for people who know a bit about Excel, but not are not necessarily comfortable with more sophisticated formulas. And that's another way you could you could play around with AI. Um, I've also talked with a number of uh, trainers um, who have put in information to do a first pass at a, a deck, a PowerPoint for training, which is, you know, another huge time saver. Yeah, and that that one's interesting, Allison, because so often there's for the learning and development folks the interplay with the subject matter experts and trying to get them to generate the initial draft. It's so much more uh, efficient to create an initial draft of the training material and give it to the subject matter expert who, by the way, in my experience, loves to tell you the ways in which you're wrong and get that <laughs> feedback and fix it up really nice. It really accelerates the process of curriculum development. Mm -hmm. Great. Those are some great examples. So you, 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 what are the, what's the bad news? So the bad news is that not all tasks are appropriate for AI to undertake. So in uh, the case of, uh, and it, it's called the jagged boundary, and we're not going to spend a lot of time today looking at, you know, what is it good at? What is it not good at? But people still complete more tasks, but the quality goes way down. And these could be things like, uh, strategy where it requires uh, pulling together 
a lot of new ideas in and synthesizing them. It could be anything that's outside of what we might call conventional wisdom. You know, crafting a uh, press release or doing the first draft of a customer service training module is something that, you know, is within the conventional wisdom bucket. Having it try to create a new material for your material science group uh, is, is a much harder problem and really outside the frontier. It'll still do it very quickly. It just will get it wrong. So, and, and I think this is the, 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 the key, right? It, and we're going to get back to this on numerous, you know, throughout the, uh, the, the rest of the conversation here, but it does, AI does not replace people. You're not going to have a robot come in and do what one of your people is doing today as a general rule. What it is going to do is perform tasks. And this at a larger scale becomes an issue uh, and one that HR is going to have to be uh, part of. Let's take the example of loan processing where you might have a team of 10 people. If AI takes on 30% of those tasks, that means that the work that's currently done by 10 people can be done by seven people. What do you do with those other three people? And we'll be talking a little bit more about that in, in, in a few minutes, but that's the, uh, the, the, the challenge. So when you look at those tasks and whether it's appropriate, here's a, a checklist and, and Allison, we're gonna make this uh, checklist available to folks, uh, right? So you don't have to, yes. to, to yeah. worry about it. But the idea is how do you how do you know whether a task is suitable for an AI or not? Um, and there is this formal evaluation process that you can go through. But I also believe that you know there is another approach that also works. And I think the next slide sort of exemplifies that uh, that other approach, which is empower your people. The people who are actually doing the work, the loan processors, for example, they're the ones who are familiar with, you know, what is routine, what is uh, automatable, what is high value, what can we control the quality of readily, and let them make themselves more efficient. So I'm you going know, to stop there and yeah, go ahead, Allison. I wanted to share uh, when when you and I were talking last week um, in preparation for this uh, webinar, I had shared a story with you. I was at a conference last week and one of the large consulting firms um, shared a story about to this point about how they empowered their people and they 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 tasked a group of their uh, team members who worked at a particular facility with thinking about how would you get rid of your job to AI? And for those of you that can share that with us, you'll get a promotion. And they said, it. people dove in, leaned into this so, um, so immediately and came up with some very creative ways about how they might reimagine their job, what pieces of it could be similar to that uh, checklist, going through that process that you just shared, but think about what could be done differently. And their point was in any change management initiative, the one of the biggest hurdles to overcome is buy-in of the people that are going through that change. And by empowering people to be part of that change, um, it may not satisfy, to your point, what do you do with the three people that that may, whose roles may go away, but it can really help uh, the organization and the individuals become more invested in, in the technology, the capabilities, and the change itself. So that's, a, that's a really good example, and uh, it's unusual in my experience for an organization to be that proactive in both embracing the change and in delegating the creativity around that change to the people who are actually doing the work. But both of those things are really important. 
I think part of the reason goes back to those productivity increase numbers that people are seeing where, wow, you know, if we can get right 12% productivity increase with a 40% increase in quality, that's, you know, that's the kind of numbers that make executive management sit up and take notice and take action. Mm -hmm. And it, it gets around to, you know, this underlying, I mean, we all know this, but to say it, the people are the drivers of performance, right? So how do we equip them to, to leverage this technology to help them? And, and that's really going to, you know, a key part of HR's role in all of this is how do you create this ecosystem where people are being empowered, are being, um, and, and empowered not just from an organizational perspective, but with the tools and the knowledge that they need, and frankly, air support for the experimentation that takes place. You know, companies like to talk about being innovative, but they are intolerant of failed experiments. And that is a really, you know, that you will not be innovative if you're not tolerant of experiments, or at least not for long. And so, you know, it, HR really has a significant role to play in establishing this ecosystem of learning and experimentation. And, and I know we've had some conversation uh, around this and, and many of you listening may have applied, you know, the concept of pilots in your organizations. But John, what do you think about not necessarily pilot, piloting a change, but piloting the use of AI in a small subgroup to yeah. get people thinking about how it might help augment their processes or thinking? I, I think it's essential. And it starts with in your own group. And I know we have mostly HR people here, uh, but there are also uh, probably some learning and development folks uh, and perhaps others on this call. And so, as we know, people like to have autonomy and they like to have creativity in their job and they will embrace the change that they help define. So within your own HR organization, you could start a pilot. It could be something very simple. Let's use AI to draft our next HR newsletter and see what that looks like. So keeping in mind that you know, once you've got some familiarity there, you have some credibility to go out, have a conversation with some group. It might be in IT, it might be in marketing, uh, that's interested in finding out more about how to use this stuff. And, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, giving them the power to do this on their own is really important. Um, engaging them to find the best use cases is, is, is key. Uh, a couple of things to think about, uh, and 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 Allison, this slide is, I think there's some richness in this slide that 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 isn't quite conveyed by the words. And I, I want to talk about people becoming AI managers. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we're seeing is the the evolution of task specific AIs. So ChatGPT or Claude or Gemini, whichever one, you know, your organization might be using are kind of general purpose. They're like, you prompt it with something and it comes back with its uh, response that could be useful to you. But what we're going to see in the coming 18 months is more specialized AIs. There's an AI here that's specifically designed uh, to help you brainstorm ideas. There's another AI that's specifically designed to help you understand your benefits options. There's another AI that's designed to help you develop your conversational skills in the workplace. And they're not, it, it's not a, you go one place, but you're actually going to have these different AIs that you interact with in the workplace in addition to your other workplace colleagues. And you're, you're going to have to start to manage those things. So today, if you're going to 
develop curriculum, for example, with AI, you're going to use a, like a chat based AI to create the syllabus and uh, you know recommend voiceover scripts, but there'll be a separate AI that's used to actually create the PowerPoint from those uh, syllabi and yet another AI that you can use to generate a voiceover from the voiceover script and so forth. So you're, there, there's going to be a really strong effort around uh, orchestrating these things. And that means ultimately that people take on more challenging tasks. Uh, you know, PowerPoint is time consuming. Having an AI do the first 40 or 60% of that work frees you up to think more about the messaging of the PowerPoint and how you're going to deliver it. So um, I think that also makes collaboration more important. We'll, we'll talk about collaboration and processes as we go along here, but those things will change when you introduce AI. You know, you, you've hit on two things that I think can be what pain points for organizations and are important, right? One is, I'll go back to the newsletter. How many organizations have newsletters that stop and start because the individual responsible for them struggles with getting information from other parts of the organization and just putting it all together on top of their day job? When we think about that task, which is important, that's important. It, to be able to say we could cut that time in half or even more than time in half is is big news. And then the to your point with the the first drafts of of PowerPoints, that is just time that would be better spent to your point, thinking about content versus actually the mechanics of the the draft of the PowerPoint. Yeah, you know, it's fun. I was talking to someone last week who was saying I, I that he uses it to make his uh, verbal, uh, not his verbal, his, his verbose emails more terse. He, mm -hmm. he just, he, he, he writes the email and then he takes the text, he puts it in the chat and says, make this simple, make this straightforward. And mm -hmm. it just cleans it up. It, it, it's his ideas. It's still basically his style of writing, but it's just gets rid of all the unnecessary words and, you know, reduces the complexity of the sentences so that it reads more easily and uh, more readily. I think um, that's a, that's an immediate way people I, I've used it to be to for for uh, looking at a first draft of something and saying, make this more concise or make this tone professional but friendly. And I mean, if you give, I think to your point, helping people understand how to prompt, whichever AI source you're using is going to become important for you to get the output that you're you're hoping for. Yeah, and I'm just gonna throw out one more use case here. Adobe Acrobat, the, the, the paid tools, now includes the ability to summarize a document. So if you, if there's some new, you know, for me, I, I, I read a lot of research, uh, you put that PDF in Adobe will come back and give you like a half or one page summary of like a 30 page report. Again, That's pretty amazing. you can't treat that as gospel, but it gives you a sense of how much time should you invest in that document and whether it might be relevant, you know, to, to spend more time with it. And that can be a, a huge time saver for folks in, you know, various departments across the organization. John, I have heard you um, talk about AI it can be like adding an intern to your team. <laughs> can you can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, I, I think of it as like it's this really super enthusiastic will work tirelessly, but can be uh, wrong about the conclusions that it draws and can sometimes miss important research as they go along. And so that kind of assistant 
needs to be developed like an intern. And if you think about it in terms of, terms of training and coaching and feedback and delegation, training is all about giving it good data. And, 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 and coaching is about giving it you know, a wide variety of data and very importantly, context. Um, and if, uh, again, we didn't, Allison and I didn't want to turn this into a technical conversation today, and, and we're not going to. When you interact with these AIs, whether it's an image generator or the uh, conversational AIs like ChatGPT, the more context you provide, the more useful what you get back is going to be. If you tell an intern, hey, I need a report on you know, current salary trends, you'll get a report on current salary trends. If you tell that intern, we are looking at pay equity within our organization, we need to know what pay structures are in like industries broken out by demographics can you know what can you find about that you're going to get the information that you need and while you know these chatbots aren't great for gathering that kind of market intelligence that kind of context setting where you know we are launching a new product that you know will allow people to save on their energy bills it is a solar panel that is more efficient and less expensive than others in the market. By giving it that context, the more you tell it about what you're looking for, it could be in terms of style. We're writing a newsletter uh, you know, that we are going to send out to the employees. We're currently experiencing great revenue growth and we want it to be upbeat and we want it to be positive and forward looking or, you know, tell the AI what you want from it and you will get back more of what you want. If you don't get back what you want, you can give it feedback. You can say that was, you know, way too upbeat. You sounded like a cheerleader. We really want you to sound like a positive coach. You know, can you tone it down a little bit? And it will do that. Right. And essentially what you're doing is you're delegating to this intern with some oversight. You're reviewing the outputs. Uh, there are many stories about interns who've been given the social media account and make mistakes that a more seasoned uh, employee would not make. Think of the AI in the same way. You want to have some control over those outputs. Mm -hmm. So I know that was a bit long-winded, but that's a great model for thinking about the AI. And I think that's something that, you know, putting putting people in, in uh, uh, work groups to work on a task, a particular task can help them develop that, that understanding of the importance of context and how it can change the output based on what the inputs are. So that's another tip for those of you listening, if you want to get people comfortable and familiar with these different tools, is to give them something that they can begin to work with and see how by giving different prompts or different context, it could change the output of the the, uh, the deliverable or the outcome. Um, John, you know, we've talked a bit in our in our conversations over the years about the the social dynamics of AI in the workplace. And I'm hoping that you can share a bit about your thoughts of what do we need to consider um, in implementing AI in a meaningful way in an organization. Yeah, you know it. It you know I was I I was mentioning the intern right, and, and uh, interns can also mess up the social dynamics of a of a team, or at least change them and alter them. Uh, one of the keys in the introduction of AI into the workplace comes down to who's in control, and there are companies where some employees are literally being managed by the AI. There are warehouse workers and gig economy workers like uh, drivers and delivery 
services where their pay, their tasks, their performance evaluations are all being handled by an AI. And uh, frankly, I'm, I don't think that's good. Uh, there, I, I think it's important that people are empowered over the AI. And uh, there's this notion of uh, um, a, a bar back for those of you who may have worked in, 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 in the food service industry, which these are the people who make sure that the bartender has clean glasses and you know, freshly cut up lemons and limes and all the things that they need in order to be responsive to customers. And the AI should really be the one who's reporting to the people and responsible for giving the people what they need to be effective in their jobs. So uh, I, I, this is a, a, a really key aspect of, uh, of, of many and I, uh, dynamics that AI brings when it comes into the workplace. Uh, I, I was just yesterday reading about uh, a study of the effectiveness of AI being used to read x-rays uh, as opposed to having the, uh, the x-ray technicians read the x-rays. And it turns out that when the AI is responsible for reading the x-rays, you're in that territory where you've increased productivity but lowered the quality. They're not as good as the humans. If you have the AI doing the first pass and the, you, the, the human being like the QA who's working for the AI, that actually reduces productivity, but it does uh, help a little bit with, with the quality problem that AI generates. But really the best solution there in terms of you know, the, 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 the power dynamic is that the radiologist is in control and turns to the AI for advice and have it take a second look at things that may be ambiguous to the radiologist. And that's the, the model that is going to best balance productivity and quality. So it's really important that you understand, you know, where the, not only, uh, you know, where the productivity increases are, but, you know, what that productivity does in terms of quality and empowerment for the people. Um, and that's, I mean, I know that there's, there's a lot there and that's just the first bullet on this five, you know, six bullet uh, slide here. So uh, I, we're going to spend a couple more minutes on this, the, the, the social dynamics here and how in this conversation. So Allison, I'm going to turn it over to you bef before I keep talking. Cause I, 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 I just had a little bit of a flashback to, you know, 2001 space odyssey where, mm -hmm. where Hal, for those of you that under, do, who, who know this movie from, I don't know when it was released, but it was maybe in the 70s? 60s, it, I think it was 60s, 68. It came out where the, 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 it really was AI. It was a computer with yes. AI. They just weren't calling that um, over the course of the movie begins to make the decisions and take control and problems our cost, significant problem. So I just yes. had to share that because, you know, it, clearly humans have to be in control and, and managing an oversight of, of AI. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the, we're, we're talking about not only, you know, who's reporting to whom, but who's responsible for training the AI. You know, often companies bring in models from the outside, you know, it, the learning and development group is often not involved in training the AI. How do we know that the AI knows what it's supposed to know about your organization, your processes, your products, your people? Um, and, you know, keeping the, those decisions, the key decision points in human hands. Uh, uh, you know, there was some research uh, done around uh, decision-making and uh, computer 
anal, you know, computers that provide decision support. And it turns out that many people use computer output to justify decisions that they've already made. Um, many others will delegate the decision to the computer, but really the model you're looking for is the computer is providing uh, insights that can guide the human decision. So when 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 you're when you're looking at you know how people are using the AI, it's that third model where the AI is providing guidance. It's not providing just justification for a pre-existing decision or making the decision on its own. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's key. And um, how do you see this in in collaboration? I know in our own organization, we uh, going through some recent. Uh, uh, decision-making processes and working with our team have leveraged AI just to put provide input in team for team conversations, and and it's become a little bit of a norm now where we might have a brainstorming session, and while we're on that call, um, we're virtual. While we're on that call, people are tapping into AI to help enhance kind of the thought process in that in that collaborative session. Yeah, and I think what that does, I think about the relationship, for example, between marketing and product. Uh, and if the marketing team is saying to the AI, hey, we've got this new product that does X, write me a press release for it. And it writes a press release for, and, and it mentions features that your product doesn't have that would be totally awesome in the market. You, know, you need to be communicating with the product group about that. And that's, that's I think, wh where I talk about cross-team collaboration here and creating opportunities for cross-team collaboration is, is it's essential because AI is going to change the, the processes that are underneath the, uh, the, the decisions and, and the productive activities that people are undertaking. And you're going to have to be more collaborative with other groups to make sure that the things that are that that you're providing input and getting input from other groups to make the things that you're doing more more uh, effective and productive. And that's I think a really important um, takeaway for getting ready to embrace this change in the workplace. Some organizations already collaborate cross team very well. Yeah. Other organizations, not so much so. They kind of operate in in silos and do their do their work. Um, and, and, and what I'm hearing you say is at least now start, start beginning that process, start getting input from others who may not, who may share a different perspective than you on the, uh, on that could influence the output. Yeah. And, you know, just want to end this slide with an anecdote, um, uh, actually a study that was done for hiring decisions that were, uh, given by AI. What I mean is the human who was applying for the job was told whether or not they got the job by an AI in one group and a separate group was told by a human. And what they found was that for people who were told they didn't get the job, there wasn't much difference in how they felt about the, the, the hiring company, whether they heard from a human or whether they heard from an AI. But for the people who were told that they were being offered a position in the company, the people who were told that by an AI were much less happy with the company than the people who were told by a person. And it's because they felt that that was an important human touch point. And so just because an AI can do something and save you time doesn't mean it should. You need to think about the human dynamics and what is the underlying message aside from the content of the message, you got the job or you didn't get the job. What are you saying by having a person involved in the loop, whether that's a customer or a potential employee or someone in another part of the organization? Really important that you think about the the, the human touch in communication there. And certainly that would either support the culture you're trying to drive or not, right? That's right. 
I mean, there are companies like Google whose customer service is primarily and has been from the beginning, you know, computer intermediated, shall we say. And that's a decision that they made and that's their culture. So we had said at the beginning that we were going to talk about, okay, so what's happening in the next 18 months? What what do you see on the horizon? Uh, well, first, the AI is going to continue to improve. Um, it's already good enough for many tasks. And this is classic disruption where it, 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 it can't replace the high end. You know, AI is not going to be able to do strategy at the level of the corner office. It's not going to be able to do, uh, you know, have delicate conversations with employees about, uh, you know, sexual harassment, hostile workplace situations and so forth. However, it can replace the routine and it's going to get better at it. It will be able to help with strategy. It'll be able to have, you know, excellent press releases that need very little copy changes, short video clip generation. People are using them to do factory simulation where you can basically run your factory in a, in a, in a simulated model and see where the, you know, it, it, things can be improved. It's crazy. So the, the, but what that means down at the level of, you know, what we all deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, the first thing is the job reality is going to outrun the job description. Think about a developer who now has an AI write all her code. And she specializes in prompting the AI to write good code and then making sure that that code works. So is prompt engineering now part of her job description? And if she leaves, are you going to look for someone who can do that? Or are you going to look for someone who would have done the job that she was doing two years ago? And, uh, you know, this is disruptive to organizational dynamics. So if she's able to do a lot of the QA, what is the role of QA in that organization? Is QA going to be using um, AI almost in an adversarial way <laughs> to test the, the AI code that's being generated by the development organization? Um, and, you know, I think at this point, we kind of get back to being an AI manager, which we were discussing a little bit earlier, right? So, you know, the job description needs to include the fact that you're going to have to manage these AIs within the organization. Um, you know, it's, it, 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 that's a really different job than mm -hmm. just writing code and doing some unit testing. This is going to affect organizational dynamics. If you're able to turn around uh, curriculum for training much more quickly, what, how, you know, now that you can quickly respond to changes in product and changes in markets and changes in, in job descriptions, now you're training, you know, what, what does that mean for how the training organization works and, and their internal dynamics and what are their external dynamics, right? Instead of long conversations with SMEs, you're having, you know, shared critical analysis sessions with SMEs around content that's already been drafted and so forth. Um, and I, this one I think is, is, is really big. And I think this has been true for a while that hiring criteria are problematic, uh, in response to floods of resumes, companies have turned to more and more keyword filters when I believe you're looking for people or should be looking for people who are adaptable, are mission aligned, are continuous learners, because much of, you know, if, if you hire for the skills of two years ago, you're not going to have the people you need today. And you're certainly not going to have people who are going to be able to adapt to all of the changes that are coming into the workplace. And, um, you know, finally, but by no means, uh, you know, uh, least, onboarding. How do you onboard people into an organization where they're expected to interact with AI or where their colleagues are already using AI, but it's not part of their job description, right? Are, are you, you know, how do you, how do you handle that in the near term, right? Hey, this is how we do things. And they get into the job and all their colleagues are doing something completely different. Who's going to prepare 
um, all of these, these these new hires. So let's let, let's stay on this slide for a moment, Allison. Uh, mm -hmm. Your thoughts? I know I kind of. No, I think it's, in, in, and I'm trying to put myself in the head of anyone who's listening. It's thinking, oh my goodness, but we're not there yet. We're we're not using AI to the level where it may be changing our jobs. And what I'm hearing you say is we have to be because the pace of AI is not going to slow down. And even though we may not see it or the use for it at the level we're talking about today in our organizations, it very well could be before the end of the year, or in, if we're taking the right steps to begin to introduce our existing team members to it and, and help them start to become uh, more comfortable with that. Yeah, and and there's another dimension to this that we haven't had much chance to discuss because we've been talking about kind of internal dynamics. There was uh, just a couple of months ago, a, a, a criminal syndicate created an an avatar of a company's CFO. Mm. And they got this video avatar of their CFO, of this company's CFO, to talk to people within that organization and have them cut a $25 million check to this criminal organization, convincing them that this was a real payment. Mm. So... Even if your organization isn't adopting AI at the pace that you think justifies jumping in, how are you preparing your workforce for a world in which AI, not only for performance and productivity increases, but employed by malicious actors, is part of the workplace. How do you know that your people can effectively evaluate a situation to determine whether this is a real customer or a malicious actor? I think that when we talk about onboarding, we often are so concerned about like how we do things internally that we don't consider, are our people ready to deal with the changes that are taking place in the world of work outside the boundaries of our workplace. And I would say, I'm sure many of you uh, listening have cybersecurity training in place. Uh, and I would imagine that is being updated regularly or should be updated regularly to include some of this, this new um, uh, malicious, malicious uh, software or manners of people getting in there with the avatars. Because it is, you know, I've seen some of the videos that were just, created through AI and they look real. I would I would be hard pressed to determine that that wasn't really um, a, a real a real actor, you know, within my company speaking. Yeah, and even aside from the 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 cybersecurity issues, there are reputational risk issues. If you're using an AI to generate mm -hmm. images, I work very hard in the, this image generation to reflect a workforce that looks like the US workforce, diverse. If you aren't careful in what you get back from the AI, it can express bias because it's trained on data sets that are not necessarily representative of your organization or your customer base or both. Mm -hmm. And your people need to be aware of some of the risks. And that's what I mean by responsible use. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we, 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 we jump to the, to the last slide, everybody. Um, which is, you know, really preparing for the future. And you you, you want to preserve your people-centric culture and focus on well-being, equity, engagement, autonomy, creativity. Make sure that your people are at the center. Uh, we talked about running pilots. You can start with your HR group and then, you know, radiate outward from there. Training and upskilling is is critical. And while this is critical to retaining your talent, it's also critical for making sure that people are using it responsibly. And uh, that gives them the power to lead in the AI adoption. And uh, ultimately you need to reformulate your hiring criteria and your onboarding curriculum. This pro tip, I cannot stress enough. 
uh, for those of you who have not been using the technology, and even for those of you who have, you can ask ChatGPT or Claude or Gemini or whoever you're using, Copilot, describe what your group does and ask the AI, how would I put together a pilot program for understanding how to use AI? What would a or what would a uh, one hour course in responsible AI use look like for this group? Or I want to have a conversation with senior management about AI. What should I talk about? I think you will find that the AI can be very helpful with getting you off the ground here. And in this way, it's a very different kind of technology than anything we've come across before. And I think that's that's really fascinating. And I I, I want to I want to share with the group a quote that I read um, in a Harvard Business Review, and and it was it was said by a professor at uh, Harvard Business School, and it says AI won't replace humans, but humans with AI may replace humans without AI. And I thought that was a kind of interesting way to close out our session, uh, just to be thinking about everybody has an opportunity to begin to dabble if you haven't already, or to, uh, to engage with AI for yourselves and also for your organizations. So um, I want to thank everyone for listening today. I hope uh, that you can take away some golden nugget from John's advice and, and counsel uh, this morning that may help you introduce or enhance or AI within your workplace. Um, I want to make sure that you do know we will be sending this a recording of this webinar out so you will have access to the checklist that John shared. And John, I just want to thank you for your willingness to, to share your knowledge with everyone today and to thank everyone for tuning in when I know you have many important priorities back in the workplace. Thank you, Allison. It's been a pleasure. Great. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your week and thanks again for joining us.